Hello, everybody. It's 648 on the 21st day of November of 2024. Um, we It's Thursday, and it's been a cold day and windy day here in Winston-Salem. Probably our first real day of winter, but nevertheless, um, we made it through, and we thank God for it. Tonight, we're going to take another look into... Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount from a completely different perspective. I think what we're about to tell you tonight will put the capper on what we told you about him teaching this under the kingdom perspective and the love perspective, because I think what we're going to share with you is going to open up a third avenue to show you how brilliant the Holy Ghost is as He taught through Jesus Christ. Well, we want to welcome our friends from around the world. Boy, this has been a big day on podcast. We've been in Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, Australia, uh, Uganda. Of course, we're always in Kenya and Pakistan. And we, we've just been in some wonderful places with our podcast. I believe we were in 10 international countries this morning when I looked and about 15 states in the United States. And we want to welcome you from wherever you're listening. We pray that God is blessing you through our teaching, uh, that we are being thought-provoking and uh, getting you to look into the Word of God. And so uh, I want to remind you that you can contact me at springston56 at gmail.com and Salt and Light Churches direct messaging. We're glad to have you in contact with us on whatever your comments may be. I also want to remind you that there is another podcast that's run by my sister Ellen Treadway called Food for Thought. It's on Podbean. And I'm sure it can be picked up almost any place that you do podcasts. I encourage you to go into that. She has some real insight into the Word of God that I think would bless you uh, as well. So Ellen Treadway, Food for Thought, and found specifically on Podbeam, but I'm certain can be picked up just as our podcast is on most any podcast station. So we want to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into the Word of God. Hi, Susan. I hope you're doing great. God bless you. Um, and so let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, open our eyes that we can see, our ears that we can hear, and our heart that we can understand what the Word of God says to us. And then may we apply it to our lives so that we can be changed into the image of your dear Son. Jesus, speak to us now. Show us what we need to know, do, understand, and demonstrate. We'll receive it, release it to your people. And from there, we will be uh, changed, connected, corrected, conformed, and confirmed into a deeper image of you. And we will ask that you do every bit of this in your lovely name, by your precious power, in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our High Priest, our Lord, and our Man in the Godhead's name. Amen and amen. So I see Lorraine and Susan. God bless you both. We're glad to have you. Now, for quite some time, the Lord has been ministering through me um, the concepts of the plan of salvation. And in many circles, that plan of salvation is a new concept because people are not teaching the Word of God uh, from that perspective at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of them do not teach anything beyond the cross, um, and they do not teach anything beyond the basics of grace and most of their teaching concerning grace is an unlimited, um, what many theologians refer to as a cheap grace. Um, and sometime I'll look into Hebrews 10.26 and talk about that with regard to man's consistent sin. But we uh, don't have many people, and I'm sure that as I have taught it, on so many occasions uh, on Facebook and podcast and even in my church, 
that people look at it and they say, well, we've never heard that before. We don't hear anybody teaching of the six parts of the plan of salvation. As a matter of fact, we hear people teaching about the cross and not anything beyond the cross. And we, we hear people telling us that righteousness is imputed to us, given to us. Uh, we don't hear anything at all about the, the plan of sanctification, nor do we understand anything about the plan of lordship. We just think that when we got saved, a part of getting saved is that automatically we make him Lord. Uh, and we certainly do not understand anything to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is the, uh, hi Mary, that is the um, uh, offshoot of Jesus becoming the man in the Godhead bodily and sitting down at the right hand of majesty. So we don't have those teachings ongoing in our church world today. And so when they are taught, they're a novel idea. And even some folks would say, well, I don't believe that. I don't, I'm not taught that. I didn't learn that. I don't see that. Well, I'm going to show you tonight where Jesus, in his very first message, taught the six steps of the plan of salvation. Now, we looked at the plan of salvation from the Sermon on the Mount, or we looked at the Sermon on the Mount, rather, from the perspective uh, yesterday and the day before of the love of God and the kingdom of God. And we saw that in there very clearly. Tonight we're going to explore the third part, the third meaning, the third piece of the Sermon on the Mount's puzzle that deals with the plan of salvation. Now Jesus has opened the concept to us, and we've explained it, concerning the kingdom of heaven during his teaching. He reaches into Matthew chapter 5 and speaks of the kingdom of heaven. He speaks of inheriting the earth. As a matter of fact, he speaks of the kingdom of heaven on two occasions in that scripture. So he's offering here as well now the input of a comforter. That's in his teaching. He's identified how the blessed would operate in the inheritance of the earth, which tells us that a work accomplished in Jesus is one that is exercised by those who have come into this kingdom of love and the kingdom of God as citizens of God in the earth right now. He's identified that we are to follow the sacrifice. And if we do, we will be filled. And you say, now what? Where did he say that? Well, when Jesus identifies those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, he's identifying the pursuit of the one who is the standard of righteousness. And that is the one that is accepted in the heavens as the righteousness of God. Who, who was he? He was Jesus Christ. What did he do? He became the sacrifice. As he went through the plan of salvation, the sacrifice became the righteousness of God. And through him, we are made the righteousness of God. But now we're going to see how Jesus taught us to follow him. We're going to see it in Jesus' teaching. So, then he talks about the merciful. He, he identifies the merciful to us and provided that merciful one to us from a love and kingdom expression. Of course, the purity of heart becomes the condition of those who live in love and operate in the kingdom of God. Peacemakers. Those who suffer for persecution for the lives of the ungodly are all a part of the kingdom of God. Then he includes his he concludes his teaching with the idea of rejoicing 
Because if we have done those things to come into love in the kingdom of God, we fit right in to what has happened to all of the prophets who have surrendered to be servants in the kingdom of God. Now, I want to stop right here and say this. Persecution is an affirmation of where you are in the spectrum of the kingdom of God. It is an affirmation of where you are in the plan of salvation. So, as we come into being reviled and persecuted, sometimes that reviling comes right from within your own home. But, in the spectrum of the kingdom of God and the love of God, Jesus said, rejoice. Rejoice in that. Rejoice in the fact. And be exceedingly glad about it. Because there is a reward for you. Because in the spectrum of the kingdom of God and the love of God, you have come into the place where all of the prophets have been. Now, I want you to look at this teaching from Matthew chapter 5 in a new light now. I want you to look at it concerning the plan of salvation. In this teaching... We're going to see Jesus unfold the following things. We're going to see him unfold the sinful condition of man when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. He's talking about the sinful condition of man. But they're going to be blessed, he said. Because whenever they come to know me and what I'm about to do for them, they're going to inherit the kingdom of God. Then he says the identification with sin is going to come to you as you mourn under the weight of sin and you become convicted and convinced. Notice who's going to do it, the Comforter. He's going to come into your state of mourning and when He does, you are going to be forgiven and you're going to be healed. That's how you're going to be comforted. The poor, the sinner, the poor in spirit is going to find comfort in the work of the Holy Spirit. Where is this happening, friend? Well, it's happening at the cross. What is transpiring? The first part of salvation, healing and forgiveness. Then there is the acquisition of those who become humble and lowly in spirit that allows us to destroy our flesh and to begin to inherit the eternal blessings of the kingdom life in the earth. Well, now wait a minute. What are we inheriting here? Well, Paul tells us what we're inheriting in Galatians chapter 5. Let me go over there and I'll read it to you. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5 exactly what we inherit. Listen. He says that we inherit the fruit of the Spirit. We inherit love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So Paul is saying, or uh, Jesus is saying that whenever you come into this acquisition of a lowly spirit, that comes whenever you are dead to the flesh. Whenever you, having crucified your flesh, you'll inherit the eternal blessings of the kingdom of God that are going to be exposed to you in the earth and they're going to be called the fruit of the Spirit. Our preservation is the second step of the plan of salvation. Our spirit man is preserved he begins to exude in us, hi Tammy, all of the wonderful fruit of a preserved and new spirit. Then, there is the destruction through deep and hot pursuit of our old nature. And then, we are filled with the righteousness of God. Wow. 
those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, we are delivered and filled with what the sacrifice has accomplished in his actions from the cross to the tomb to the region of the damned. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus identified that right there in verse 6 of chapter 5. He's talking about the plan of salvation that is bringing us into the place where our sin nature is deposited and we are delivered in the righteousness of God. We are brought by righteousness now into the holy place to be sanctified and called brethren of the sanctifier. How do we do it? Where did Jesus say that? Well, let's look down here. He said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What do you think Jesus did whenever he went and became the high priest over your own sacrifice, over his own sacrifice? He distributed blood on the vessels of ministry for the absolute mercy that was required for you to become a priest, a peculiar people, a royal nation, a royal priesthood. Now not only can you obtain mercy, but you can be the minister of mercy. What a mighty God we serve. Think about that. Now we have come out of the deliverance into the righteousness of God. And what are we moved into whenever we're sanctified? We move into the absolute safety. Now we're absolutely safe. Now the church world wants to tell us we're safe in the cross. But the plan of salvation tells us that we are safe when the sanctifier sanctifies us and he calls us brethren. That's when we become safe. Hi, James. Jim, how are you? Now, we obtain mercy in the sacrifice that is overseen by the high sacrifice by the sprinkling of blood on the vessels of ministry. And so now we can see the plan here, the fourth stage where we become safe in the plan of salvation. Now what the world wants to tell us and what, what the church wants to tell us is all of this stuff happens like that. Jesus, somehow or another here, is not putting it into an, a miraculous and instantaneous work. Now let's read. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, the poor in spirit are those that have not yet found Christ. But they are mourning because they're under the religious microscope. They're under the law. They're under the problems of the law. They're under the, the bondage of the law. They're under the rule of the law. And so as they mourn, and he's talking uh, not only about those that were under the law, but those that were under sin. They're mourning because they have no comforter. They have no reprover. But yet, when the reprover shows up, the blood that's shed by the sacrifice is taken by the reprover and applied to their lives. And all of a sudden, they are comforted. They are convicted and convinced. And they're no longer mourners. Let me tell you something else. They're no longer poor. They're alive in the Spirit. They're no longer mourning. So look what he said. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the mourner, for they shall be comforted. I've given the Holy Spirit to comfort you, to reprove you, to reprove the world of sin, to convict you and convince you you don't have to mourn anymore. You don't have to stay in religious bondage. You don't have to stay in the bondage of sin. You can be free from it. How is it going to happen? You're going to be identified as poor in spirit. But I'm going to take you to a place where your mourning is going to become a blessing to you 
because the Holy Spirit is going to be revealed to you as the comforter. And when he is revealed to you as the comforter, you're going to be saved, forgiven, healed in your spirit, man. Well, Jesus has just told us of the condition of man and the remedy that's coming to them. See it? Now then, we go down and we see, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now what is happening in the tomb? What is happening in the tomb? The meek, their spirit is preserved, but their old flesh nature is inheriting the earth. Their old flesh nature is dying. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. Their old self has died. And going back into the earth, back to the dust from which it came. And out of there comes a meek, a lowly, and a humble spirit of man. Spirit of uh, a spirit that is filled with a new fruit. A new mechanism to live by. The old nature is gone. It has died and gone back into the earth. But the new nature of the spirit of the fruit and the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus has infused them. And they are resting in Christ Jesus. They are resting in His Spirit. They are functioning and operating, thinking and moving from His Spirit. And all of a sudden, out of them begins to exude love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith, kindness, all of the blessed fruits because their old nature, their old flesh has left them. Oh, we see part two, don't we? He's preserved the spirit so that he can be infused by the spirit of life, and of the fruit of the Spirit. Now let's move on. Let's see now. So we have now gone down to where they are moving into the region of the damned because they are now hungering and thirsting. They have taken on a new spirit life. They're operating in a new love for God. They're operating in a new walk with Jesus and they are so hungry and thirsty that they want to follow the sacrifice into the place where he became the righteousness of God. They want to be righteous like he is righteous. Hi, Carolyn. They want to be what he has become. And Jesus said, here's your next step. Follow me. Hunger for me. Thirst for me. Live for me. Think of me. Follow the sacrifice. And where's the sacrifice going? The sacrifice is headed into righteousness. Right into righteousness. We can become the righteousness of God only when we follow Jesus into the sacrifice. As the sacrifice. Deposit our sin nature. Be delivered which is the next step of salvation. See, whenever we are delivered, what happens? We're filled. Filled with what? Ha-ha, righteousness. We're filled with righteousness. That's exactly what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 5 and verse 20 and 21. We are filled with a righteousness because... How? It wasn't imputed to us. Look at what Jesus is teaching. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness is something that is obtained. It's something that is attained. It is done by following the sacrifice. If you follow the sacrifice, who is righteous? into righteousness and are delivered into that righteousness, guess what? You are filled 
with righteousness. Well, my Lord, friends, we're seeing Jesus identify the six steps of the plan of salvation. We saw him in healing and forgiveness, the comforter. We saw him identify our poor spirit, sinners. We saw him identify what the comforter would do to the mourner. We saw him how we would become meek and lowly with our old flesh life returning back to the earth. Now we're seeing him as he goes into the region of the damned and says if you will hunger and thirst after the righteous life. Well, what must righteousness be devoid of? The sin nature. Must be. You cannot be filled with righteousness and exude the sin nature. Won't well, work that way, friend. The sacrifice was not geared and blueprinted from the foundation of the world to make you righteous while you live in sin. He said that if you hunger and thirst after the sacrifice's work, which right now is righteousness, then you will be filled. Now look at the next step. Now he comes in to this beautiful phase that we call sanctification that nobody teaches, nobody preaches, nobody shares, nobody thinks sanctification and being separated to holy living has one iota of importance in the world we live. But Jesus did. Jesus did. Look what he said, blessed are the merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. Now where did you obtain mercy? Did you obtain mercy at the cross? Did you obtain mercy in the tomb? Did you obtain mercy when you are, were raised in righteousness? We know that you obtained mercy when Jesus sprinkled the blood on the vessels of ministry in the holy place, we know that because it was there that the work that was done by the sacrifice in the earth was confirmed and verified by the high priest who was the overseer of his own sacrifice. So you following Jesus, must come into the place where you obtain mercy. Obtaining mercy separates you. What does it do for you? It makes you the brother of Christ or the sister of Christ. It makes you so that he can come into the midst of your church and minister himself by name to you right in your worship. It makes himself so that he can minister the blueprint of the plan of God from the foundation of the world directly into your life. It makes it so that he can minister the table of showbread, the body and the blood right into your life. It makes it so that you can come through the smoke and have access into the very throne room of God and there find grace and mercy to help in your time of need. That's what this mercy that he has given you. Now watch what else it does. It makes it so that you can be a minister of mercy. Someone said, now how are you going to do that? Well, Jesus is going to bring you to that in just a moment. I'm going to show you from where your personal ministry of mercy goes in the plan of salvation. Well, I'm, I got to get this tonight now. Look at the next part. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, once we have mercy put upon us and are called the brethren of Jesus Christ and are sanctified, 
to which he is not no longer ashamed of us. Now, the purity in our heart allows us to make him Lord. For they shall see God. It is from the Lordship of Jesus Christ that we are accepted in the blood and seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So now, as having found mercy, Jesus, in both Mark Matthew 28 and Mark 16, gave us the ministry of mercy as he produced for us the dominion and gave us his name to use to cast down devils, speak with new tongues. Nothing inside us or outside us would hurt us. Everyone we laid hands on would recover. And he would confirm the word with signs following because he was the Lord seated at the right hand of majesty. Well, what have we seen? In the sanctification, in the holy place, we became safe. Safe in him for the first time. Absolutely safe. He became our advocate. He became our <coughs> spokesperson. Excuse me. He became everything now as the high priest. And we found all of the mercy that was available. Then we follow him through the smoke into his lordship. We're being pure of heart now. We have the privilege to use his name. We have the privilege to operate in his uh, uh, authority. We have the privilege to operate in his superiority. We have the privilege to tell the world about the commands of Jesus and know that he is with us always, even unto the end of the age. We have the absolute privilege of his lordship. And when we use the name of Jesus and we call knees to bow and tongues to speak and things that have a name to obey the name of Jesus, my friend, in his lordship, he says, I have given that one dominion. Why? Because he came through the morning. He came through the meekness. See that? He came through the thirsty. He came through the sanctifying. He's coming to me in lordship. I hear his prayer. I operate from his prayer. I move upon his prayer. What has Jesus done? He's brought us through the first five steps of the plan of salvation. Isn't this message thrilling? It's thrilling to me. Now let's go to the last part. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the children of God. I began to look into that yesterday because I had seen the first five stages. The stage of healing and forgiveness, the stage of preservation, the stage of deliverance, the stage of safety, and the stage of soundness, complete soundness in the spiritual world as we come into his lordship. But I said, Lord, what is this peacemaker thing? And then I began to study the word and I found out that in the Hebrew, the word peacemaker means the one who is totally complete. The peacemaker in the Hebrew is the one who is totally and absolutely complete. Don't you know that Paul said that in the man in the Godhead bodily, that we were complete in him? Jesus is defining for us the six phases. We are now absolutely whole. We are absolutely whole in Him. Look what He said. Blessed are they, are the peacekeepers, for they shall now be called the children of God. Now, I want to show you this. In Colossians chapter 3, we were the elect of God. But when we come into the completeness of the man in the Godhead bodily, where we are operating in the Spirit, where we are operating through the gifts of the Spirit, where we are flowing in the kingdom understanding, the kingdom of love, and citizens and ambassadors for Christ Jesus. When we are living in that, we in this plan of salvation are functioning 
as the children of God. Adoption was what we were. But when we come into the completeness of the plan of salvation, adoption is in our rear view mirror. We are absolutely complete. We are called the peacemakers. We are called those that are total. Those that are lacking nothing. Those that need nothing. Those that require nothing. Those that have every ability to have advantage and to profit in everything complete in Jesus Christ. Jesus has just told us the kingdom, the love of God, and the plan of salvation. And he said this, know that there's going to come persecution. Well, of course there's going to come persecution, friend. He was persecuted. The Jews were persecuted. The prophets were persecuted. The early church was persecuted. No, it is a, almost a badge of honor to be persecuted. But one thing for sure it is, it is the ability to have an evaluative benchmark to say where you are in the spectrum of spiritual things when you're persecuted. See, the world doesn't look at it that way. The world looks at persecution and say, oh, well, there must be something wrong. Oh, well, he must have done something wrong. Oh, well, now, I, what I hear about the circumstances is, I wouldn't have done it like that. But my friend, persecution is nothing more than a benchmark that tells you where you are in the spectrum of the plan of salvation. If you are under persecution, then you are moving and following the sacrifice into the plan of salvation. Now, in my ministry, I've been under some persecution. I've been reviled. I've been lied about. People have told dramatically uh, in-depth untruth. And when it happened, it hurt. But I came to understand that in the end run, God was going to show who and whom He approved. Who and whom He approved. They said about Jesus that he was a man approved by God. So persecution is always, reviling is always people saying bad things about you. Well, if they're false and they're untrue, if they're false and untrue, now if they're true, they're true. But that wouldn't be persecution. That wouldn't be persecution for something you did that was real and true. That would be answering for your crime. Persecution, however, is coming upon those in the plan of salvation as a lie. And when it comes, well, Jesus said rejoice. He said rejoice in that because that's what they did to the prophets. So you can have a benchmark to know where you are in the plan of salvation. And if you're handling persecution by keeping your feet on the ground, often your mouth shut, and your eyes on Christ, and your mind stayed on Him, then my friend, according to Jesus, you've come a long way in developing this blessed plan of salvation. And you are blessed. God, I pray that you will minister to your people, that you will bring us into truth and peace, and that we may know that in this blessed plan, we can see where we are, and we can know that we need to go and follow the sacrifice unto the very end and then live in the sacrifice 
and allow the sacrifice to cause us to have every advantage and profit with all. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I saw James and Carolyn and Austin and uh, Tammy and Lorraine and uh, Susan, um, and I'm sure there's others. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. We'll be back again tomorrow night. May God richly bless you. We love you and we appreciate you. Until tomorrow evening.